Hi, Luke. Hi, Shelley. Hey. Ta -da. It's good to see you too. Thanks again for joining us, church, as we consider Acts and church subversive and all the different things that that means for us and for what it means in the text. Thanks again, Luke, for your message, taking the time and the energy to do that and to deliver uh, uh, an encouraging and challenging message. It was helpful to, to hear and enjoyable as well. Uh, so uh, there's lots of different ways I'd like to go, but I'll, I'll ask a question here. <laughs> um, actually, what you said uh, in regards to Acts 10, and Glennis did a devotional on Thursday on Acts 10, and it dovetailed really well. I just want to go back into, there's a lot of things happening in this chapter, a lot of things happening in Peter's life and Cornelius' life and for the life of the church. And just so I want you to like, remind us again, who's doing the work and how is that happening in terms of like what's creating all this change just to kind of review that quickly for us yeah i mean i think the work of the spirit is a huge driving kind of catalyst in this passage for me anyway um you know how how these two people who never would have met, you know, God kind of appears to both of them in visions and kind of makes this connection that wouldn't have happened anyway. Um, um, because I think, you know, God saw this need of this connection to happen for the, the gospel and the good news to spread, um, you know, to the ends of the empire, I suppose. Um, but I, I think, you know, there's, there's work being done in Peter as well in terms of, um, how the spirit, I assume for the past year or so that since Pentecost uh, has been working in him and changing him, how he comes to the roof to pray. And although maybe he was getting a bit hungry at this point, um, you know, he's, he's spending time in prayer with God. And that's kind of where the, the change kind of starts to occur is that in this conversation or in this relationship that um, Peter has with, uh, with Jesus, that. Um, the spirit is shifting something in him to kind of um, change his perspective. Um, and then, and, and I kind of talked about in the sermon about the 60 K journey up the coast to, to Joppa. I, I, I touched on it for a moment, but you know, I, we've, we've all been in lockdown for what, uh, two months now, right. And whenever we need to sort our thoughts out, we will go out for a walk, don't we? Yeah. Uh, so I suppose, uh, you know, Peter would have had a lot of time, um, reflecting on this bizarre kind of experience he's had uh, on the rooftop, um, perhaps praying more, perhaps process, spending some time processing, um, rethinking his own um, walks that he would have done with Jesus. Um, yeah, I, so I think that there is this sense of, you know, the spirit is doing a lot of the heavy lifting, but yeah. it's in Peter's obedience and his kind of walking uh, with the spirit that is facilitating or that God is using to, to help this change in him to happen. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. There's this really, um, John obviously is my favorite, um, but as we read John together, there was this towards the end, so 15, 16, 17, there's this conversations about what the spirit would do and how it would provide. And, um, you know, the bringer of all truth. Um, so this truth has been at work in Cornelius as the spirit has been moving in him, but this truth has also been working in Peter, as Luke said, you know, on that conversation up to Joppa, is he remembering those conversations that he had with Jesus, those crazy interactions that happened with the Greeks and the Samaritan woman and all these other people. So that the spirit is leading both of them into truth is really nice that it, and it comes from completely different angles. Um, yeah. Both the rope, the dirty Roman, you know, as yeah. he's been viewed and Peter, like the best of us yeah. um, have both and are still having truth revealed to them. Right. No, I, yeah, I appreciate like that, that connection there of, well, two things. One is that, yeah, there's prayer and there's also like journey reflection and there's, um, there's time in there too. Uh, and so all these pieces, again, is another place that we see the Holy Spirit at work. And so lest we get confused and thinking that the Pentecost, that Pentecost is the only way that the spirit shows up and, you know, there's like tongues of fire and that's it. But in reality, it's visions, it's, prayer it's reflection it's journey 
all these different things that the Spirit works in order to bring change to both Cornelius and Peter. Um, and I think that's really important for us to remember too. You know, I think that God, I guess, is always at work. He is always at work, but just to remember that for sure, that the Holy Spirit um, does not stop in pushing and poking and prodding, which may make it good for us to keep paying attention. Now, all my dreams don't make any sense. I'm sure of that. Uh, <laughs> So I know, I know there's others in our church who do experience dreams that seem mar, far more coherent and spirit-oriented. Spirit Mine are just random. So I'm thinking that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit does not speak to me in that way, but maybe so it does for others, and it's good to <laughs> be aware of that. Uh, I want to I tackle what I think is maybe more the core of the sermon that you, you were working on, Luke, and both or Luke and Shelley in terms of this. So... Luke, I felt like you really, you did a really good job in terms of honing down on the core reality of what Peter was coming to understand is like what God has declared clean, don't call profane. Mm -hmm. And in the text that you read, as you come to the end of Acts 10, is that comment of like God shows no favoritism. And here for Peter, it meant Jews and Gentiles, which you did a really good job of helping us to see the distinction there of those two pieces. Uh, and that was helpful. And my question then is for the both of you is, in your reading of Acts 10 and your study of Acts reflecting on, is there a, a real clear parallel for our day and age in regards to an ethnic um, maybe barrier that we need to step across? So Peter, who's a Jew, is stepping across to the Gentiles and, and even like on the far end of the spectrum of a Roman guard, centurion, um, which is just pulling his brain apart. <laughs> And his heart, and at the same time, you're, you know, you're making some suggestions that we need to think a little bit about what are our hidden, our blind spots, our, our places. Is there a parallel for us in regards specifically to ethnicity and places that we need to step into? Yeah, I mean, yes, yes, yeah. yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, gosh, putting words in my mouth that I agree with. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, ab absolutely. I think that there's, there's a clear um, thing going on here between, you know, I, I make mention of how um, Cornelius is the first kind of proper Roman we meet yeah. in the book of Acts. And he's so much different to what Luke's readers would have expected, or even like, I mean, we've we've met other Romans in the gospel, but like the the image that comes with a Roman is um, ends up being so much different to what Peter finds when he when he steps out of his comfort zone. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's there is a parallel for us as uh, we, you know, meet people who um, come from different walks of life or are you know have other kind of cultural traditions that we're not um, super knowledgeable about or understanding of that actually we we meet with people who are different to us and we realize that um you know actually god is at work in in this place just as much as god is at work in our place yeah um and and but peter had to had to go 60 miles up the coast and go into a house that um it was unlawful for him to go into to kind of yeah. realize that so i think it a kind of speaks to our blindness uh, in terms of um, you know how how are we um, interacting with and um, I suppose being welcoming of and um, participating with people who are different to us, but also um, it, it's it's it speaks to you know the kind of um, stepping out of the comfort zone that it takes to kind of begin to unravel um these kind of preconceived notions that we we live with sure. on the daily yeah yeah, yeah. I've, I've been thinking about um this idea of privilege that peter has carried as mm. a jew like he knows he has known his whole life he's been told by every generation before him that you are god's chosen people and yeah, here yeah. are the boundaries and if you live within them great um and so i i wonder if there is a certain tension in Peter that he's unwilling to welcome others into what into his place mm. because what does that mean for him you know like is, yeah. is does it mean that 
God loves him less? You know, is this, this is the eternal question of the, the older child who has that conversation. Oh, so you're having a new brother. Yeah. And it's like, well, hang, hang on, how does that work? Like, mm -hmm. how can you love more? Yep. Um, and how, how can we, one, maybe be aware of what place that we hold with God um, and be also be willing to welcome other people into it? Mm. You know, um, so what judgments do we put on us? Is it that we love God wholeheartedly or is it that we know the words and how our church service looks like? Or is it that we don't spend our money here and that we do spend our money here? Like what are the things that, that we have chosen to mark ourselves off as that then put us on a pedestal that we are unwilling to give up that pedestal sure. because what it might cost us. Um, sure. yeah. yeah. So are we out for me? The question becomes, are we willing to welcome others into the favor that we perceive ourselves to have? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that, that becomes real sharp and pointy real quick. Yeah. 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 And I, I think like, as you mentioned the pedestal, you know, we think of, you know, Peter's pedestal that he's kind of clinging on to because he thinks that that's what it's kind of been wrapped up in his identity of what it means to be a part of God's people. Mm. Um, but actually it's the kind of, it's the letting go of that, that actually leads to him becoming greater. Mm. Um, and so, I, you know, if we think of, you know, what, what are we missing? You know, what are the obvious things that, you know, like we, we see this obvious thing for Peter, but what are the, the obvious things that we're missing about ourselves um, that, that if someone were to be reading about us in 2000 years would be like, wow, they just really didn't get the gospel, did they? Um, yeah. And how, and, you know, how do we identify those things and become, you know, greater um, followers of Jesus. Oh, there's lots of cutlery falling around behind me, but, um, you know, um, how do we become, you know, identify those things in ourselves and become greater followers of um, Jesus? And I suppose that kind of links into the how stuff we were talking about before about being in prayer and, you know, um, are we processing these things and um, are we talking to the spirit? And yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. But and I asked the question in part because I think, nobody here is unfamiliar with the fact that that Auckland continues to diversify significantly mm -hmm. um, and even as I you know listen to people talk about the the good old days well everybody has the good old days like it doesn't matter where you are there's always a good old days about what once was and that's that is good I mean those things are definitely to be celebrated um, but those good old days were also new days for those who would have been 50 years before you know like the good old days are good for somebody, but they were, you know, a struggle for somebody else because it was a change or a transition. Um, and Auckland continues to diversify, and you could argue that it's a, it's a beautiful thing, but it also can be quite an uncomfortable thing, depending on the blind spots or the the sensitivity maybe that we have or the the, the perspective that we have about what, what what those people who are not like me or you, um, and I realize, actually, I fit in that category. I'm not like you. Uh, <laughs> And you've got a beard. In. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, but it is a question, and you realize, like, I think Acts is really helpful in a number of different ways, and it's challenging. And I felt like this in your sermon is like, you weren't just saying it's just about this, it's actually about a number of things blind spots. What are the things that we don't see? Um, Peter had time. You know, there's a year from Pentecost until now, at least maybe a little bit longer, that God is at work in him. And he's wrestling through what it means to call Christ as Lord for the people of God to be shifting, if you will. And then all of a sudden, here's the next step that the Spirit is going to guide him on. So God does take us on a journey, and the Holy Spirit is integral to that, obviously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, and then what you're saying, too, is that oftentimes when these blind spots are removed, it doesn't make us less. It makes us more. It makes us uh, greater, more colorful, if you will, a better perspective. Um, it, it shifts us to see more of who God is and more of other people. And I think that's really quite profound. And I feel like you're, you're, you're poking around there, um, but also giving everybody the space to go, okay, God, what are you doing with me? Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me and where I'm at? And what's my blind spot? Um, which could be a number of things. I just, I want to, encourage us all to think along those lines and to ask that question you were commenting about Peter and Cornelius having a meal um, being such so important 
for Peter to actually be outside of his home. And Shelley, you were mentioning that too. It's just like he couldn't, he couldn't hold to his own boundaries because he's not at home to hold those. Hmm. You know, he doesn't have a pew to give up because he's not in the church to give up his pew. He's actually at somebody else's house. Therefore, everything is different. Hmm. And that's okay. That might be easier. Um, but at the same time, Luke, your last question, the bonus question, was about, you know, how do we make the, the youth room more welcoming? And your opening illustration was about the foyer and recognizing that the change wasn't just for change sake, but it was to open it up for an invitation to people, whether it be for the food bank as one of the, the major focuses, um, but also for our congregation to actually feel welcome in a new way or guests to come in and feel welcome. Um, so there's two things here I just realized that, you know, for us, how do we do these together? One is to provide space that's welcoming for others to come into, that we are glad to welcome people into our space. What needs to happen there? And at the same time, how do we get out of our own comfort zones and go into other people's spaces and maybe eat a meal with somebody whom we would not normally eat a meal with because we'd say, that makes me really uncomfortable. How do we, how do, we do that? <laughs> That word uncomfortable you keep using today. Um, <laughs> but I think that's exactly what it is. We mm. actually have to become comfortable in the uncomfortable. Well, and it mm. might just be an awareness of it. Like, this might be awkward. I'm probably going to say the wrong thing. Let's be aware of that. Sure. So it might be as easy as having a conversation. Um, it, sounds, it feels like eons ago now before the lockdown, I had a conversation with a very um, strongly held Muslim woman. And I'm like, the first conversation was, I had the first thing I had in that conversation with her is like, look, I'm probably gonna get some things wrong. I have some assumptions. I've got some questions. Forgive me if I come off like a brat, but also mm -hmm. tell me when I do. Sure. Um, because I knew it was going to be awkward. I knew I was going to say the wrong thing. I just already, but mm -hmm. that gave, um, that gave space and it gave awareness to an action of grace that then would be given back and forth mm -hmm. rather than, you know, just, right. um, yeah. so yeah, it becoming even, but even that was felt really uncomfortable. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. So being uncomfortable and being uncomfortable, it's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that there is a sense for, you know, we, we talk about, you know, being, I, I talked about like the foyer becoming a welcoming space or the youth room mm -hmm. uh, be, being a welcoming space. But I think a huge element of that, obviously, are the people. And, and you know, I think, you know, it's interesting that, you know, it, it Peter going out is kind of what's going on on here and it's like actually as we go out do are we making you know as we're in the community as we're with people um who we're not always around you know are we um are we welcoming in that space i suppose and willing to be welcomed in um i think is a, is a huge part of it um you know because we we often you know we'll, we'll walk about with our shades up you know i talked about kind of you know, kind of having like this yeah. vision and we're, we're trying to like, you know, contain ourselves and, um, and resist being pulled in different directions. But do, you know, yeah, I think like that's a huge thing is, um, n not only about the way we carry ourselves, but being willing to be invited and welcomed into other spaces is, um, yeah. a huge thing. And I think like, that's probably the, the scariest thing for Peter here is, Sure. Like, you know, he mentions those, like, I should not be here, yeah. um, but he's there. And um, that's where, you know, that's where um, everything happens. So, yeah. Well, it, even just you guys saying that, it's interesting is that one, and sometimes when we ask these questions, it can feel like this, it opens it up to everybody all the time. But in reality, I think the question is, you know, if you look at our own lives and say, okay, who are the people that we walk by and don't even notice? How many Roman centurions that Peter walked by and never even think about seeing. Mm. And all of a sudden, you know, he's probably got a few in terms of where he was from that he might look at a little bit different and say, I run by that guy every day. Now what? Mm. You know, so who, who are the people that are regularly in our life that we, we see who 
who might be like, I don't know if they really have any interest in the gospel. But, but this text reminds us that God's at work everywhere, and the Holy Spirit is moving in people's lives in all sorts of ways. And we have no idea unless we're like, okay, send me. So if we pray and ask God, in my specific life, in my steps by steps by steps, and the people that I run into on a regular basis, what do you want me to do? How do I, if you will, you know, bless them or, or watch out for them? How do I invite them to a cup of tea or coffee on a break and say, can, can I just know a little bit more about you and just ask rather than talk? And um, yeah, you just, you know, those little steps that we could do where we listen or we learn or we just speak in some ways, goodness or kindness or gentleness or truth in there. And maybe it goes as, you know, we get the, the guidance, if you will, that we're supposed to go and drop the gospel message, if you will, like Peter did. I mean, it was very clear what he was supposed to be doing. Mm. But there's a lot more journey as well. If you look at the rest of Acts, you know, different conversations happening all over the place. Which maybe is, it, which I'd probably close it closer, and it says, in our own life sphere, who are the people that we run into that we need to ask God, open my eyes that I may see what's going mm. on, and how do you want to use me to push me out? Um, and again, as you said, I want to start at the beginning to say, who is it that's actually encouraging Peter? It's, it's God who's giving the strength and the courage and the direction. And so Peter may be scared out of his wits and know he's doing everything wrong. It feels against the grain, but yet the spirit is definitely guiding him and saying, this is where I want you to go. <laughs> mm. And he's all along going, this is not right. This is not right. Um, just kind of cool. Mm. Well, that's it. I mean, I, uh, I really appreciated Acts for lots of reasons, but I really I like this reality of it calling us out to the good of other people, which is what as a church we're trying to do. So thanks, Luke. Thanks, Shelly, for the conversation, the sermon, the reflections, and as well as the openness to be there to let God use and work through you. Um, and I hope that's the came for all of us. So Church, as we uh, look forward to meeting again, uh, whether it's on this platform or live, uh, face-to-face, we do pray that God will be moving through you and guiding you, uh, as he did Peter and Cornelius, but also us as well. So peace, and we'll see you soon.